Ladies and gentlemen, this speech is going to consist very largely of questions. The Greeks said that to know the right questions to ask about any subject was already halfway towards knowing the answers. We do not claim to know all of the answers about Vietnam, nor even all of the valid questions, but we certainly do know some questions about this sordid affair which the American people should be asking. One, when are we going to win this war in Vietnam, and why not? Is it possible that the most powerful nation on earth after spending some 40 to 50 billion dollars per year on its military preparedness, cannot lick a puny bunch of half-starved guerrillas in a country the size of Missouri? Or is the real difficulty the lack of any will to win, or even any desire to win, on the part of the Johnson administration? Two, why fight them in Vietnam and help them everywhere else? And if you do not believe we are helping the communists everywhere else, you need only to read your daily papers. In fact, Washington is becoming so palsy-walsy with Moscow that we have just entered into an arrangement for the Soviet Union and ourselves both to send huge quantities of wheat to starving India. Whether the 200,000 tons being sent by the Soviets is actually out of wheat which we have already given them the report didn't say, but our help to Soviet prestige in this affair is perfectly obvious. Also, the administration is right now moving heaven and earth to bring about more so-called trade with Soviet Russia and all of its satellites. And most of that trade turns out, in any final analysis, to be simply gifts in one form or another from the United States. Despite all absurd and deceptive pretenses to the contrary, Moscow is still boss of the whole communist world. In my opinion, as stated many times during the recent years, while this pretense was being created about a split between Moscow and Peking, it is just as phony as was the supposed split two decades ago between Tito and Stalin. And in any event, Moscow and its satellites are sending equipment to be used by the Viet Cong in Vietnam against our soldiers there, while Washington helps to keep these communist regimes in power and in position to do so. Putting it more concisely, our boys in Vietnam are being killed by Russian bullets fired from Russian guns, while the Johnson administration sends the Soviets wheat to feed those who are making the guns and the bullets. Three. How is it possible that supposedly mortal enemies, namely the Viet Cong and ourselves, while locked in a so-called battle to the death, can keep on declaring time out for holidays, huddles, and repairs? What kind of a war is this? In a football game, there can be time out because the conference or the league controls both sides, and the enemies are not really enemies, but friendly rivals who are doing it all for sport. Is some similar conference or league running both sides of this war, or is it all just a show? Have our brave boys who are maimed and killed been let in on this fact? Four, is this war being run by the United Nations, or isn't it? Is it being run by CETO? And if so, is that the same as being run by the United Nations? Of course, we know that the answer to both questions is yes. The Australian contingent of troops, for instance, is not there by the orders or direction of the United States, but of this Southeast Asia Treaty Organization, exactly as the Turkish contingent in the Korean War, and in fact our own troops in Korea as well, were under the control of NATO as Walter Lippmann so gleefully boasted. And CETO, like NATO, by the very treaties which established it, is a regional subsidiary of the United Nations. But it would be good to get a lot of congressmen, for instance, and other people too, on record about this matter, or asking the same questions for us. Number five, why? When we are asking for troops to help us from all other allies we can get, do we not ask Chiang Kai-shek to send over his half a million men? They are the best trained and the most knowledgeable troops in the world for fighting communist guerrillas in Asia, 
and their whole ambition in life is to have a chance to do so. And what kind of nonsense is it about our being afraid of bringing red China into the war when, according to the UPI dispatch of December 22 from Manila, Foreign Minister Chen Yi of Red China is already boasting, however falsely, that Peking is supplying 70% of the aid being received by the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese. And when the Peking regime has also repeatedly stated that it would send troops to help North Vietnam at any time they are requested. Number six, where is there any real difference between this mess and the one we went through in Korea. In that case, even after the Red Chinese had come into the action, thus making it, as General MacArthur said, a whole new war, we not only refused to allow Chiang Kai-shek to come in and help us, but we kept our 7th Fleet patrolling the Formosa Strait to make sure that this ally did not attack our enemy. The 7th Fleet is still patrolling the Formosa Strait, you will notice, and for the same purpose namely to protect Mao Chi Tung's regime. There are a dozen other vital similarities in the picture. This is just the same old roadshow enacted in Korea where MacArthur was fired for even trying to win the war. It has now been moved south a thousand miles and reopened at a new stand with the same plot, the same management, and a very similar cast. Once again, we are sending our men to fight against the communists in a war which is actually being run on both sides by the communists. But why should we be stupid enough to allow it all a second time? Number seven. In 1916, President Woodrow Wilson, during his campaign for re-election, used as his main appeal the theme that he had kept us out of war. But at that very time, the insider, Edward Mandel House, was having the plans drawn up and approved at the White House for us to send a huge American expeditionary force to fight in the European war. In 1940, President Franklin D. Roosevelt, during his campaign for re-election, used as a strong appeal his statement, quote, I say to you again and again and again that every step he did to assure that American boys would be sent into the war in Europe by the hundreds of thousands, just as soon as it could be contrived after his re-election. In September 1964, President Lyndon B. Johnson, during his campaign for re-election, proclaimed, quote, we are not about to send American boys 9,000 or 10,000 miles away from home to do what Asian boys ought to be doing to protect themselves, unquote. But at that very time, as became obvious later, he was a party to plans for gradually moving hundreds of thousands of American boys into a war in Vietnam. We know now that the communist influences headed by Edward Mandel House were controlling Woodrow Wilson, whether he was conscious of it or not. We know that Franklin D. Roosevelt was not only completely surrounded by communist influences right in the White House, but was fully aware of it and even boasted that many of his best friends were communists. In view of the incredible advance of the communists everywhere during recent decades, does anybody have any doubt as to who is really running the things in Washington today? Or that our actions in Vietnam are being conducted exactly according to communist plans and wishes? Number eight, are we actually at war in Vietnam or aren't we? In one breath, the administration tells us that this is simply a police action within a friendly nation to help the government and people of that nation protect themselves from communist guerrillas. Communist guerrillas, incidentally, whom we, meaning the Roosevelt administration, set up in business under Ho Chi Minh in 1944 and 1945 with American money, equipment, and support. In the next breath, the president himself tells us that this is war. And we now read about more and more bombing raids by American planes over the territory and capital of a supposedly independent nation, North Vietnam. But if this is war, then what happened to Article 1, Section 8, Paragraph 11 of the United States Constitution, which decrees that only Congress can put this nation into war? Number nine, since we are in a war, even though an undeclared war, why do we impose are allowed to be imposed so many incredible handicaps 
on our men who are trying to fight it. Our bombers are regularly required to fly dangerous missions with only a small fraction of the effective bomb load they could carry. To enter North Vietnam, they must fly a specified route, well known to the enemy, which makes the operation so dangerous that the pilots call this route Slaughter Alley. In bombing the supply route to the Viet Cong, known as the Ho Chi Minh Trail, through Laos, our bombers are required to confine their attacks to targets within 204 feet from the trail itself. So the communists, when they see American planes coming, merely pull aside until they are 205 feet from the road and figuratively thumb their noses at the helpless American pilots. Villages may not be attacked, no matter how superficial their appearance may be. So the communists build what look like the roofs of huts over the beds of their trucks. When they see American planes coming, the communist supply trucks merely stop and huddle. And presto, as somebody has said, you have an instant village which is immune from attack. On the ground, in most cases, the boys in our detachments are not allowed to fire on the enemy until they have been fired on first. We recently published the true story of one American soldier lying in a hospital bed with both legs blown off whose chief concern was that he might be court-martialed because he had fired on the advancing Viet Cong before they had fired on the position which he was holding and they were attacking. What kind of a war is this? And whose side do you suppose the people are on who have laid down or even accepted any such restrictions? Number 10. General Westmoreland has estimated that 80% of North Vietnam's military supplies have been coming to that country through the port of Haiphong. He had already said that if we stopped the flow of war supplies to North Vietnam by sea, Hanoi would be forced to the conference table within three months. Nobody doubts that, even if we do not wish to bomb Haiphong out of existence, our 7th Fleet could bottle it up for the duration. Why is it not allowed or ordered to do so? Is it because an attack on Haiphong would tend to put an end to the war, while attacks on Hanoi merely tend to escalate it? Is General Westmoreland aware that if he showed any real determination on his part to win this war, he would be fired even more quickly than was MacArthur? Or, let's move now to a series of more fundamental questions. Number 11. There is the most fundamental of all, why are we fighting in Vietnam anyway? For what reason? Or what objective? What are we trying to accomplish? If you have ever heard any straightforward answer to that question which makes sense from either the administration or anybody else, then your ears are better than mine. The only answers we have heard simply prompt more questions. The answer most frequently given or implied by the administration, for instance, is that the United States, meaning its government, is duty-bound and determined to oppose communist aggression. This tempts any informed listener to come out with a huge horse laugh and ask sarcastically, is that so? But instead, for the present, and as a hypothesis, let's accept that explanation as if it were bona fide. Then further questions pour out faster than we can list them. Number 12. The most obvious is, then why pick Vietnam and Vietnam alone for this opposition to communist aggression? We first went into Vietnam, or made it theoretically our protege, in 1954 by throwing the French out and putting the communists in. As so-called observers at Geneva in 1954, but really running the show there, we turned the top half of the country over directly and officially to the communists and set up an anti-communist government in the bottom half exactly as we had done in Korea in 1948. In both cases, we thus prepared the way for the communist aggression from the north and the war that would follow exactly as the communists were already planning. There was a tremendous difference in the caliber and quality of the two governments of South Korea and South Vietnam, respectively, but both were eventually to be overthrown by conniving from Washington when they had served their purposes as foils in the long-range communist strategy. Now, since 1954, there has been vicious and vital 
communist aggression all over the world. In Ghana, in the Congo, in Indonesia, in Singapore, in Algeria, in Cuba, in the Dominican Republic. The communists have proceeded by guerrilla action, mass murders and cruelties, treasonous subversion, and diplomatic pressures to set up one communist tyranny after another. And in every case, the administration, whether headed by Eisenhower, Kennedy, or Johnson, has been visibly and actively on the side of the communist aggressors. Basically, of course, it has been the same administration all of the time, controlled by the same influences, carrying out identically the same policies, with politically hermaphroditic characters serving alike in so-called Republican or Democratic administrations and with bipartisan treason rampant everywhere. But this treason to the United States and treason to the human race has taken the form of brazenly helping communist aggression everywhere else since Korea until we come to Vietnam. Why the change? Well, you may remember General MacArthur's warning that the only kind of war in which the United States should never engage was with ground forces on the continent of Asia. One reason is that for our communist enemies in Eastern Asia, human life is entirely too cheap and too vastly expendable. Right now, for instance, because of a fantastic animal-like increase in the population, Red China has some 200 million young people under 20 years of age, over and above what would be its normal youth population. Mao Chi Tung's brilliant adventure in birth control a decade or more ago by having prospective mothers swallow live goldfish simply did not work. So he has on his hands, or soon will have, as many as a hundred million additional young men, most of whom are not capable of doing anything productive whatsoever, but every one of whom wants to eat just as much rice as anybody else. There is no question but that when and if this war is allowed to follow communist strategic plans and gets escalated, to the point where we are again fighting the Red Chinese on the ground in Asia, as we were in Korea, then the monsters in Peking have a hundred million surplus and hungry young Roberts whom they would love to have killed off, especially if each hundred of them could take just one American soldier to the grave with themselves. For then the American people would cry for peace even at the price of being ruled by the communist United Nations as the last great step towards a worldwide communist police state. And the circumstances are being created and groundwork laid right now for that ultimate flowering of the present embryonic and poisonous little war in Vietnam. Is this why we have been committed to such a war? Number 13. But let's look further along the line of MacArthur's thinking. In two world wars, American boys have proved themselves to be wonderful soldiers in any form of battle where the opposing sides wear uniforms and some kind of civilized rules prevail. But neither by nature nor by training are Americans suited to fight as guerrillas in swamps against enemies to whom dirt and starvation and disease are as normal as the hot climate. Enemies who delight in cruelty for its own sake and who regard human life, including their own, as on the same level with that of insects, and enemies whose vast numbers offer a bottomless reservoir of replacements for those who are killed. Nowhere else in the world could American soldiers be taken to fight at a more terrific disadvantage than on the ground in Southeast Asia. Is this why Vietnam was picked as the one place for the United States to make its ostensible stand against communist aggression? Number 14, and there is more. Vietnam is almost exactly halfway around the world from Washington, D.C. It would be impossible for the United States in fighting a war to have longer or more difficult or more costly supply lines for its troops. When this administration or the next one, still under the same communist influences and run by the same insiders, escalates this war until we have one million, then two million, and then three or four million men fighting the Red Chinese in North Vietnam and in Southern China, and probably in Cambodia and Laos and even Thailand as well, the cost will be staggering enough to supply the excuse 
for the most confiscatory taxation and controls that even the communists in Washington can devise, while the length, size, and complexity of the supply lines will make it easy for communist traders at a hundred points along those lines subtly to sabotage and misdirect and confuse the equipment our boys need in the field far more extensively than in the worst of our similar experiences so far. These disadvantages to ourselves and advantages to the communists would be almost overwhelming. Is this why Vietnam has been picked for the crucial battleground? Or let's take a simpler approach to the whole subject. If this administration or any administration really and truly did want to fight the communists and to save some other nation or people, why not run the beasts out of Cuba instead of Vietnam? Cuba was really our protege nation, and for a much longer period of time than the present gang in Washington have pretended to hold South Vietnam in that esteem. Cuba is right at our doorstep, and the communist regime there is infinitely more damaging and more dangerous to ourselves than one in South Vietnam on the other side of the world. For a war in and over Cuba, and even if you give some consideration to some nonsense about the Soviets coming into it, most of the advantages as to supply lines and style of fighting would be with us instead of our enemies. Can you or anybody else name one reason why we should not be fighting the communists, if at all, in Cuba instead of in Vietnam? Or do the powers which control Washington want us to be fighting only where we are at the greatest possible disadvantage and where the pretense that we could not win if the administration wanted to do so can be given the greatest surface plausibility. Number 16. In 1954, when North Vietnam was turned over officially to the communists and South Vietnam was made theoretically an independent nation, the Kyodai religious sect with about three million adepts ruled by their Pope Pham Cong Tak was devoutly anti-communist. So was a smaller sect, the Hao Hoa, with about two million followers. The former Emperor Bao Dai, who had been restored to a semblance of power in 1949 by the French as Chief of State, was bitterly anti-communist because of his personal experiences as a captive pawn of Ho Chi Minh, as well as from tradition and principle. Li Van Vien, the former Vice Lord of Cholan, had become not only powerful and respectable as head of the Saigon police, but was the most formidable and efficient foe of the communists in all Vietnam. He had ferreted them out and put an end to their terror wherever it appeared in the Saigon area. Today, those two sects have long since been destroyed by pressures, briberies, and attacks of various kinds, all approved by the American advisors of Ngo Dinh Diem, whom we put in power as prime minister and then in 1955 as president of the newly established republic. The Emperor Bao Dai lives today in exile in France. So does Le Van Vien. In the meantime, and this is the only place where I'll reach tonight into that touchy subject of the Ngo family, in the meantime, President Diem's brother, the former labor leader, Ngo Dinh Nhu, was for years the virtual head of the Communist Party in the Mai Tho area of South Vietnam, while as, quote, advisor to the president, unquote, he controlled the army and the police of the regime and an underground party of some 70,000 members which spent much of its energy turning in denunciations of anybody who was opposed to the Ngo family. But it would take hours just to outline the most incredible confusion, factionalism, cross-purposes, bitterness, and divisions and subdivisions of every kind and for every reason, from sincere religious convictions to the splitting of graft and spoils, which have been built up in South Vietnam since 1954. This disunity is so complete, so extensive, and so deep that we cannot conceive of it having gone so far unless it had been deliberately fomented and planned by the American forces behind the scenes which were in actual control. Even if the administration in Washington honestly and actually wanted to oppose communist aggression somewhere, there is almost certainly nowhere else in the world 
that its action would be so handicapped by dissension and distrust among the native anti-communists, all of which raises the question of why and by whom such nefarious and evilly productive intrigue was carried out. Or perhaps even more important, has this present war for its present purposes actually been planned by the communist conspiracy since as far back as 1954 and all of the groundwork laid accordingly. Number 17, the one and only way in which unity could be restored to the South Vietnamese people today would be by the return of the Emperor Bao Dai in some capacity. He still commands the personal loyalty of all sides except the communists. The one and only man who would have the following, the ability and the determination to weld the native fighting forces of Vietnam into one loyal anti-communist army and then to use that army effectively to wipe out the communist guerrillas is Le Van Vien. He says that without any American help, except in the matter of supplies, he could sweep the whole country clean of the communist Viet Cong gangs which now infest it in three months time. And there is no reason based on past experience to doubt his assurance. Both the Emperor and Le Van Vien would like very much indeed and would obviously give their lives if necessary to restore their country to a normal, peaceful and independent existence again, effectively free of communists within its borders. If the administration in Washington really has any interest in ridding South Vietnam of communist aggression, why does it not bring in the two men who can be of the greatest help for that purpose? Number 18. History shows clearly that Henry Cabot Lodge played a leading role in turning Algeria over to the communists. He has been similarly helpful to the communists in many other times and places. History also shows with equal clarity that Edward Lansdale played a leading role in originally driving the French out of Vietnam to make it easier for Ho Chi Minh and his communists to seize the country. Yet for the past couple of years, the direction of our war in Vietnam, supposedly against the communists, has been virtually in the hands of those two men. Why? With all of the patriotic Americans there are to choose from, why would any administration which really wanted to stop communist aggression in Vietnam put our effort in the hands of men who have always been willing to yield to or even actively to support communist aggression? Number 19. Is the real purpose of our fighting in Vietnam simply to be at war? for the power and the spending excuses and the political advantages which being at war gives to the administration. There is nothing new about any such strategy on the part of rulers under whatever title. In fact, the idea has been used so long and so frequently throughout history that Shakespeare gave it dramatic recognition nearly 400 years ago when he had King Henry IV give his son Prince Hal, who was later to be Henry V, the following advice. Be it thy course to busy, giddy minds with foreign quarrels. It is through the opportunities offered by embroilment in foreign wars that any government most easily increases its size and its reach. Is it this primarily for which the administration is letting our boys be killed in Vietnam? Number 20. Or is the real explanation even more tragic? and more sinister. Is the war in Vietnam, with the actions on both sides controlled by the communists according to a blueprint in advance, actually a long-planned and vital part of communist strategy for the final steps in the communist takeover of the United States and with it the rest of the world? Is the obvious lack of any will to win on the part of the administration really something far worse and part of a carefully planned design not to win, imposed on us by the communist influences which are running the show. What is the basic plot? Now, there are a great many more questions which could be asked about the conduct of the war. Quite a few of them are being asked, in fact, by some of our ablest generals, generals who are still military men instead of politicians in uniform. There are also more good questions about what we are trying to accomplish. But let's move on instead to a few final questions about what the communists are trying to accomplish. 
are about the comprehensive strategy underlying this whole chapter of history. Number 21. The American people always have been and still are willing to make more sacrifices and to put up with more demands by their government for the sake of fighting communism than for any other purpose. The two greatest aids to the worldwide communist advance since 1945 have been the American Foreign Aid Program and the United Nations. Yet both were sold to us as means of opposing communism. And these tremendous drains on our national resources and national sovereignty were accepted for that reason. Are the American people now to be carried the great final step into complete submission to communist tyranny through the deceptive mechanics of a war being fought ostensibly to oppose communism? Number 22. We have been cunningly led into a situation where, according to communist plans, we have only two alternatives. A. We must increasingly support the continuation of a war which serves communist purposes under conditions where even our demands that the war be won can be distorted into excuses for steadily making it larger. Or B. We must give attention and substance to protests which insidiously make the whole communist line seem more respectable and which strongly serve communist purposes in many other ways. The bitterness and cynicism and doubt growing out of all this dilemma can gradually permeate the whole American mood. Has it all been planned that way as a part of the total plot? 23. Full-scale war always creates or increases a moral breakdown within the participating nations. For at least 50 years, the communists have been using every conceivable means through movies, television, radio, education, publishing, and even massive infiltration of religious bodies to destroy traditional morality and even any sound sense of values among the American people. For the destruction of individual moral responsibility is a fatal blow against any resistance to communism. Is this a major purpose of the long and gigantic involvement which is planned? 24. 100% government is communism. A growing obsession on the part of the American people with an interminable, ever larger and ever more horrible war could enable this or any future administration not only to increase taxes and controls and government paternalism to fantastic levels, but it could increase its arbitrary powers and its detailed reach over the lives of all individual citizens and suppress mercilessly all opposition to its policies and its decrees until the tentacles of this central government in the United States would be hardly distinguishable from the tentacles of the central government in Moscow or in Peking. The conditions and the time would then be ripe for the long-planned worldwide merger. Have all the steps towards this 100% government already been plotted and timed? Are the current proposals for greatly increased Social Security payments, for an enormously expanded budget, and for increased powers and agencies of the federal government on every side simply taken from the blueprint which has been prepared long in advance. Number 25. All of communism, of course, is simply a gigantic lie and fraud made up of lesser lies and frauds as component parts. The most important of those components today is the ever greater pretense and publicity about a growing rift between the Soviet communists and the Chinese communist regimes. For these regimes, ladies and gentlemen, are merely two arms of one octopus-like body with an incredibly intricate nerve center which serves as a composite brain. These two arms could no more oppose each other in reality rather than for show than your left hand could engage in a serious battle with your right hand. When they pretend to do so, the show is for the purpose of distracting, disarming, and eventually strangling an enemy. There is nothing new about this kind of pretense in communist strategy. Around 1950, it took the form of a supposed split between Tito and Stalin. 
All of the details were carefully stage-managed with almost infinite realism. Magazines such as Life devoted whole issues to glorifying Stalin's hatchet man, now called Marshal Tito, as a great new friend of the West who had defected from the international communist body headed by Stalin. Eventually, this fraud netted the communist world through Tito some three billion dollars in gifts of American goods and money, plus even far greater gains by the confusion and loss of morale to anti-communists which it caused. Right while life's glowing eulogies of Tito were appearing, we wrote a small book, May God Forgive Us, which was finally published early in 1952. In that book, we devoted several pages to pointing out the absurdity and impossibility of there being any such rift at all. There were many reasons for this certainty. One was that internationalism is of the very essence of communism, and a national or nationalistic communism is no more possible than dry water or iron wood or a coal fire. But our book reached only about 200,000 readers in 1952, while Life's articles had reached several million. We have called attention in print to other similar but less important pretenses on several occasions. But now we are faced with a manifestation of this kind of fraud which makes all earlier manifestations pale into insignificance. Already, under the contrived and stage-managed circumstances of the Red Chinese attack on the Indian border, which the Soviets pretended to oppose, it has supplied the thin veneer of plausibility needed for our government to send more than a billion dollars worth of American war material to the communists. The consignee of these shipments, of course, was that lifelong communist henchman, Jay Nehru. Their ostensible purpose was to enable him, with the moral backing of the Soviets, to resist the Red Chinese invasion. Their real purpose was for future use by the communists wherever needed. And the same fraudulent rift has been of tremendous value in other ways to the communist cause. But we believe that its basic importance and place in communist strategy are still to be revealed. For the Soviets opened more doors and made more progress by being our allies during World War II than through any other step they have ever taken. Now the ground is visibly being prepared, has been in preparation in fact for several years, for the Soviets again to become at least our informal allies, giving us their friendship and moral support in our forthcoming colossal struggle with, quote, the Mongolian hordes, unquote, of China. To what end? Let's project a possibility. When the loss of hundreds of thousands of our sons and most of our liberties, and when fatigue and frustration and despair have eventually made the time ripe and the American people ready, the Soviets can step forward as mediators and arrange for everybody, including themselves, to come in out of the Holocaust under the umbrella of the United Nations. Thus, we would never actually admit defeat by the Red Chinese, nor they by ourselves, but all of us, including the noble Soviets, would meekly surrender to this world power, the United Nations, and gratefully accept the peace which it could provide. And then this communist peace would turn out to be, as it always has been everywhere, simply another name for such abject slavery under a brutal communist tyranny that no resistance would dare to raise its head anywhere on earth. Is this the plotted culmination of the long conspiracy? There, my gentle listeners, you have a lot of questions with few answers. But every day, even while these notes are being finished, as in the administration's budget proposals for next year, including $12 billion extra or $20 billion altogether for the war in Vietnam, it becomes more likely that the true answers to these questions would frighten the American people out of their wits and maybe out of their lethargy. And it becomes obvious that if the administration is letting our men be killed in Vietnam in order to help the communists carry out the plot adumbrated by these questions, then it is murder indeed. And those responsible should begin to feel the wrath of the American people. This whole war, as presently conducted, is as phony as a $9 bill. And we ask, are our boys being consciously and deliberately murdered to serve communist purposes? If so, you are never going to put an end to this crime by pretending that the administration is merely naive and confused and making infinite blunders. 
If the communist influences over the administration are as controlling as our 25 questions certainly indicate they may be, then the influence of patriotic public opinion had better be raised to the strength of a mighty and overwhelming wave, and it had better be soon. As to what should be done, we suggest four steps. One, go ahead and win this war, promptly and conclusively. The artfully contrived and massively prepared handicaps do not prevent victory. They merely give some semblance of plausibility to the long stalemate which has been planned. And victory will come in a very few months whenever Washington has the will to win forced upon it. Two, Set up an unquestionably and firmly anti-communist government in Saigon, preferably under the Emperor Bao Dai or his son Bao Long, so as to give visible stability to the regime, and preferably with General Le Van Vien as the Minister of Interior, so as to keep any communist infiltrators and troublemakers in their proper place. And his idea of the proper place for communist murderers, incidentally, is in a prison or a grave. Number three. Issue an ultimatum to Hanoi and Peking so strong that none of these red puppets will even dare look in the direction of Saigon, and Moscow itself will shudder at the thought. Four, and then bring our boys home. In my opinion, we should never have become involved in Vietnam at all. But regardless of how we got there, or who put us there, we are too deeply involved today to have any honorable way out except through victory. It should be our determination not to escalate this war, nor to prolong it, nor to muddle through it, but to win it. A great American once said, in war there is no substitute for victory. This is certainly one time and place in the history of our nation when we must not even consider any substitute. Victory, then peace, must be our slogan and our goal.